you know, when you have talent, you have to let them grow to be creative so then they can also grow within themselves, right? right? Which is also the opportunity that I didn't have coming up under people because they didn't really afford me that opportunity. And I think it stunted my growth to an extent and also made me cagey and want to leave places. I've done this before. Very good. Welcome to a new episode of the Liberated Podcast. What's this called? The Liberated Podcast. Oh, this is new. This is new. This All is right. a this is a very new ish thing. I'm Nick Jimenez. This is where we have conversations about the way that we understand, secure, and exercise freedoms. I am joined. Wow, you this like that? So- Already so deep. There's a tagline and everything. There's involved. a tagline. This already has and so much more structure tagline. than what I'm used to. There's a deep tagline. Right. Uh, I am joined by Michael Beltran. Mm-hmm. I'm not even going to call you a legend. This is a different, there's a different, deeper tone. Oh, here. man, it's good. We're treating this with more seriousness. Uh, look at the way Petey's sitting over there. Right. Holy shit. I even mean, he's getting serious about this. That's a serious stance. I'm going to pause from this podcast to take a picture of how seriously Petey's taking this. We have a, our own studio audience. Hold on. I'm going to do a video. Yeah. I'm nervous. Look at this. Yeah. Look how seriously Petey's taking this podcast right here. Holy I'm already shit. falling asleep. He's falling asleep already. <laughs> Snoozer. These two losers. God, why do I have to listen to this guy again? And over it. And we're done. <laughs> over it. <laughs> Fuck this. Um, so, uh, for those of you who are not aware... Which mm-hmm. I imagine is very few of you because right now this is right in that like twenty two listener neighborhood. Uh Dying. Michael Beltran is the host of another Dade Mag dot com podcast, Bang Gong Podcast, Spanish for Podcast Sandwich. Also eight ads at DadeMag dot com and just give all of your money to Pang Gong Podcast. Right. That's right. All all the money. All of it. Every every penny. Yeah. Um Mike has been described, uh, much to my chagrin, as my creative life partner. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And uh, we, we talk about a lot of things on Pancom Podcast, uh, but we'll be a little narrower. There will be a little more structure here. I do super well like that. Yeah. Well, you know, I figured I, there was more structure because there's snacks. There, there's a bowl of honey mustard nuts. Right. Is it nuts? It's I don't not know nuts. What it is. It's honey mustard pretzels. It's, so it's all pretzel chunks. Right. Got it. Okay. Those were sent by uh, from those came from uh, they were ordered from Salina, Kansas. I don't think that they're actually a Salina company, but still. But you know, there's a Salina, Kansas connection. Well, for those who don't know, Pancom Podcast's biggest listener base, right, is based in Salina, Kansas. Huge, huge, huge. Yeah. Um. So, when you think freedom and conversations that we've had it's tended to be cuba related and we sort of discussed already that we are not going to go that direction right here now right. this we time we do a lot of that we do maybe too much we do do yeah do do um so i, I want to talk about freedom in a different sense from the in the than the way that i've talked about it with other people okay so for context for people your flagship restaurant of Ariad Hospitality Group, which used to be ARC. Yeah, right. Ariad Hospitality Group is Ariad. Correct. That was the baby and the lone baby for quite some time. Mm-hmm. You had a reputation, but like you really built the reputation that you have now on Ariad. Sure. And then there's been like this explosive growth. Right. With restaurants primarily in the Coconut Grove area. Huge. Not, ex- not exclusively, but primarily. Right. And I think explosive is fair because it's – give me a sense just – I mean, we'll get into more detail later, but, like, what's what has that growth been like just to give people a sense of, like, how that switch sort of flipped? Well, I mean, you know, the growth part of it, like, we're very opportunity-based, right? Like, we don't actually go looking for opportunities in – like, if people come to us and I guess the fundamental basics of restaurants are, like, your lease um, – you know, location, lease, what kind of concept can you put there? What's the neighborhood missing? Oh, but I, 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 and we, we can talk about how that happens. I just mean in terms of the the rate of growth that you've experienced. Like what's the number of restaurants gone been oh. like in the last, uh, you know, a year ago, two years ago? Right. So, 
you know, year one, we had area, but my business partners already had Taurus. Mm -hmm. um, I didn't become a partner in Taurus till a little down the road. So we had one, and we had one for, you know, almost almost four years, right? And then um, we had in the works already for a couple of years to open up Nave, which would have been our second restaurant. Uh, but Nave was, you know, kind of like a disaster build out. And then in that process, so I guess you go year three, we're planning a second one. We're going into year, year four. Um, in that process of building Nave, I was given an opportunity to um, to do a pop up of a little pastelito croqueta Cuban breakfast pop up that was called Chugs, and the idea was that it was only supposed to be six months. So in my brain, I'm like, you know, because I don't like the idea of growing entirely too fast. And at that point, we didn't really have the infrastructure to do so. So you know, year four, we went two to three, um, and then uh, obviously a lot of things happened in that process too. Right. Yeah. Right around that time, we opened up our second bar on the beach. So um, then we had four concepts. Mm -hmm. um, and then uh, we now here in year six, we took over control of another business. Right. So now we're at five. Right. So five concepts total. Right. All right. Let me just make sure it's area. Nave, Chugs, Taurus, Scapegoat, and now the Gibson, which is currently the Mighty, so it's six. Right. And then there's some that are like in process now. Right. So that's the whole other difficult part about growth, too, is that like a lot of these restaurant things could take years to develop. Like even before you start building something, you could be working on a lease for a year. Permitting could take another year. So like something that maybe opens at the same time as another, you could be have been planning it for two years. Right. And then it just so happened that it got to that stage. So right now on the bend to open, we have three, six more concepts. Yeah. Um, actually with a small seventh, which is a test model. So we'll, we will have 13 concepts by the end of next year. Right. And for purposes of this discussion, I think that those are in a lot of ways just as relevant. Sure. Um, so what I want to get into is freedom in in a sort of creative sense uh -huh. right and and this will have a little bit of overlap with another conversation that you had on step into the sandbox um but i'm i'm i want to know about what the what your sense of creative freedom looked like before your second concept opened right because you you went into ariette with I don't know how common this is. Maybe you can speak to some of that. But sure. the what is your flagship now and what I think you probably anticipate for the foreseeable future will be like what you really hang your hat on mm -hmm. creatively. Yeah. Was also your first concept. Correct. Right. So you sort of went into it with uh, from conversations that we've had before. A lot of constraints, not only external, but internal that like you put on yourself yeah. creatively. Mm -hmm. So talk a bit about what it was like for you going into opening the concept and the sort of expansion and contraction of those boundaries that were on you and that you set for yourself over that time. Well, I think you're like the biggest thing at the beginning, at least creatively, especially like the way that I started was, you know, I didn't have much of a name at all. Like um, executive sous chef, sous chef, chef, you know, for whatever, 10, 11 years before I opened my first one. You know, never a lot of publicity, and that's just kind of how it works, right? When you're a number two or a three, whatever, mm. and that's the way it works. Um, so in that first year, like, it was really discovering, like, a balance of, like, be creative, but also find some of those kind of, like, backbone items that would get people to come, right? right? That people felt a large level of comfort with. And then having given them the opportunity to try something different or weird, right? Right. So, you know, I remember early on, it was like, you know, no one's going to order foie gras. No one's going to order grilled oysters. No one's going to order venison or whatever. And, you know, I guess like maybe those were our more um, curveball items, you know, uh, but we still had a short rib. We had a half chicken. We had a burrata. We had stuff that drew, drew people in because they were very, you know, it was very common. Yeah. And it's still very common stuff. And like, for example, we still have the short rib on the menu. Uh, it's just been elevated and refined. Right. But, you know, we no longer have half chicken. We haven't put 
burrata on our menu in years and it was really at the beginning it's like how, how do you get people in and then when you get them in make those backbone items delicious maybe a little interesting uh but just really just delicious and then hopefully they're willing to take a shot on some of the other items uh, like a foie, we had a beef tongue tartine for a long time. We had venison tartare for a long time. Uh, we had beef heart tartare for a long time. Like you know, some of the more interesting stuff, you know. Yeah. And um, I think the creative, like, I think being honest at the beginning too, because a lot of kids want to come out and they just want to say like, "Fuck it, I'm just gonna fucking go and I'm gonna crush this. I'm gonna put all like this weird outlandish shit on the menu." You know, that's super risky, man. And like, I. Uh, I don't like the idea. Like to me, it doesn't sound like a solid game plan. And th and that's part of what I mean by maybe some of the constraints you put on yourself. Right? For sure, some of that risk checks mm -hmm. some of the freedom you want to give yourself. For sure. Yeah. And like I, I mean, I, I I made that plan. I never had that conversation with anyone. Like the this was my plan from day one. Is like get people in the door, get it going, get people to know who you are. Try to work on hospitality. You know, fun drinks. We used to have happy hour. We don't do it anymore. Um, you know, just kind of like be a neighborhood place that's got like some interesting stuff and a little bit outlandish or whatever. And then really just get them in the door. Yeah. Open for brunch. Right. Make brunch like pretty much like a normal brunch. Right. And that's you're doing volume. It's like a marketing thing. It's not necessarily like great for. I mean, it's good for business, but it's not like great for business. Yeah. Um, so I guess that was like those are. I wanted to feel freedom, but there's also a, a large sense of um, fear in that freedom, too, because, you know, now like I remember at the beginning, like I was shitting a huge brick, right? I signed it. I signed the fucking loan for a ton of money. Um, I had no fucking money. And, you know, like I, I at that time, literally, I lived in a fucking shack, right? With like barely barely running water and shit. So I'm like, this is life. You know, like right. no one's going to help get me out of here. So I got to make this shit work regardless. So um, I think that's like what I did. And I tried to come up with a smart game plan to at least get people in. And then once I had them in, little by little start chipping away at the normalcy of the menu. But that shit takes years. Yeah. You know, I, I wonder now looking back. You, you were shitting that brick. Sure. If If you were in that cliche time machine situation where you could talk to like day one Michael Beltran at Ariette. Sure. Would you tell him that that fear was well-founded or like if you had it to do over again with all, would you tell yourself like, you know what, actually maybe it's better to give yourself that freedom and hit the ground running, establishing that identity. Cause on the, uh, first of all, there's the business considerations, but also, I mean, it's not like an eternity has passed, but you're, like anybody who's been doing a thing for multiple years, you're also more capable now. Mm -hmm. So maybe at the time, even if you'd been fearless, you wouldn't have been as capable of executing that vision. Correct. I, I, I don't, if I were to use a time machine yeah. and go back, I'd be like, stick to the plan. Got it. Okay. I like, I just don't see, I wouldn't change anything about the journey. Okay. The f super fucked up days are super like, um, and, and not in the sense of like, Oh, you know, cause every, it, because you actually feel like that was the right way to go. Yeah. Yeah. For sure. I mean, I, I think because um, a lot of people will look back on their mistakes and be like, "No, but I'm glad I made the mistakes." And yeah, know. no, I mean, and I made, I, I did make a ton of mistakes sure. too. But I think yeah. the, the mistakes weren't from the creative freedom aspect of it. Yeah. I think the mistakes were other shit. Yeah, yeah. And I made a fuck ton of mistakes, and some of those I would like to change. But at least from like the menu direction, the idea behind the restaurant i guess like the only thing i would go back and say that i changed was like you know day one of that restaurant we didn't like identity wasn't super firm okay you know like we were a new american we were a new latin american it was like a very hazy thing yeah and i think when things started to really change and people started to adopt or understand a little bit more is when we just said listen we are a uh, progressive cuban restaurant that uses miami as inspiration yeah you know which is a little vague too but that's okay um but it helped them understand a little bit more about like what the shit really was yeah. you know um so because you know like we're not a french restaurant we're not new american restaurant you know like there's there's a lot of like layers to it but i think that the insecurity portion that has nothing to do with freedom uh at the beginning kind of hindered me from 
completely being creatively free. Right. Because this goes a little deeper. Um, creative freedom was not something that was ever given to me to that extent my the entirety of my career because I worked for a lot of great people, right? And they didn't necessarily give you a ton of freedom to do your own thing. So when you go to be who you are, sometimes you don't totally know. Yeah. So you have to like kind of lose your footing a little bit and fuck up and just kind of like not be totally sure. And it sucks. That process really sucks. Um, Cause uh, it's like going back to cliches is like, you know, discovering who I really am. Yeah. You know, yeah. like it's very um, Rafiki talking to, um, in the, the past. Right. <laughs> right. Uh, it's a lot of that, you know, um, but. That was a terrible review. It was, but it was pretty good. I was more thinking about Rafiki when he hits him with the thing. You yeah, know no, he, that's that's why that's why because because um, uh, 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 Simba is saying like, oh, it doesn't matter. It's in the past, and then he hits him oh. over there. He's like, oh, what'd you do? It does not matter. Oh. It's in the past. <laughs> right. Yeah. Yeah. We're on the same page. Yeah. No, I know. It's like we've done this before. <laughs> it's weird. Um. So yeah. Freedom. Got it. So, <laughs> has no one done that on the show yet? No. What do you mean? I know. Braveheart? Total failure. I'm inviting Got the it? wrong people. Freedom. I also have a picture of you holding that barrel sheet, the barrel lid like a shield. Oh, that's, that's a perfect. Good place to put and then in. just put over it. Freedom. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. You got to try to paint half my face in blue. That's good. I'm sure we can get a horse under you or something. I mean, you know, we have, we have the technology. I mean, look at how good I am at this. This shit. thing is litty. It's super litty. Right. Um, if only I had the rights to problem kids. Yeah. Uh, Marty. Uh, so you mentioned having worked under other people and the freedom they did and didn't give you. Sure. If we were in the head of week one, Michael Beltran, where you're like, not that you'd never had a hand in managing other people, but now like, you know, your name's on the sandwich, as we like to say yeah. on the podcast, <coughs> and you're managing other people and you're really ultimately – setting those boundaries, not just for yourself, but for other people. Talk a bit about like where your head is then and how your understanding of, of that aspect of it comes into play. Right. Cause you, you're, you're at this level or you're at this level of restaurant where you're looking for talent. The part of what you want is for them to be able to be creative, yep. right? Whether it's in solving problems or creating new things. And yet it all needs to fit into the vision of whatever area it is where you're in the driver's seat there, right? So you're, you're driving the bus to use a, a new Charles Barkleyism. I like that. Yeah. Um, I would say that week one, me, obviously we've talked about this a ton. Like we talk a lot about now creation through collaboration, right? Hmm. I don't necessarily know that's where I was at the beginning, right? I would say that, you know, creativity within creativity there's a lot of insecurity so in that process you become very stubborn and insecure of hearing out other people's ideas which it probably would have been a good idea to listen to them so you're a little more stubborn and you more, more than you did you mean um you said that you're because you were saying it would have been a good idea to listen to them you're saying you, right maybe you didn't listen enough I, I don't think i listened enough right i had a lot of super talented um chefs around me that had been with me for years but it's also like just the immense amount of pressure uh because your name is on the sandwich that it's like you know this is the way that it needs to be and honestly like looking back i i, I didn't really know what i what i was doing you know it's like yeah i think this is how it should be but it, you know i don't know if i really knew you know and right um you know, I guess that was like a, a pretty hardcore failure. But, you know, you learn from that stuff. And, and we're completely different now. But I also feel like uh, the small sliver of success that we've had um, has amounted to at least – there's several things, too. It's like at the beginning, at least in the chef world, it's all about like there's several big names and there's all this kind of – and you're nobody. Like you're just, you're just a guy, you know, in the corner of Coconut Grove where nobody yeah. walks to. Right, yeah. And – um like now we're fortunate enough that we have like a pretty, pretty solid reputation. And I just like back then, I think I paid more attention to like what was happening around me. And I think now I just don't, you know, like I think a lot of that has to do with, um, you know, cause we've been decently successful. Yeah. Is, is there just to kind of like put a finer point on it before we move on? Is there a, a dish that's on the menu now that was like a product of, of, somebody else's creativity that you gave them the freedom to exercise that you think 
you know what, if that person had been in my kitchen in my first month at Ariette, I, I maybe would have been too afraid to give them that freedom. Well, I think that there's two dishes that are, have been on the menu since day one that were influenced by other okay. people. Sure. Um, I mean, but these are, uh, they have been two of my best friends for like many, many years. And it was really like, you know, our grilled oyster. Now we have two at the beginning. We just had the bone marrow ones. And we had this like really interesting idea of like changing the butters all the time. Right. Yeah. And we we're going to do a different grilled oyster every week. And we we're going to do like this, that, and the next. And, um, you know, like a week before we opened, Tony Galeno, which is now the uh, executive chef of Mandolin here in Miami. Um, we were like uh, doing some research and stuff and you know we came across like bone marrow flan and we came around bone marrow butter and he was like dude what if we just did an oyster with bone marrow butter I was like it's delicious let's try it and then we tweaked it we fucked it a little bit we did it a bunch of times and we did it the first day and it never changed okay and then the short rib uh, Tony and I were drinking on my shack's porch one night at like 5.30 in the morning and we're just talking about like how, and I was expressing how I really wanted this like, um, because I, I, me personally, I'm not a fan of short rib, right? Yeah. But I, again, it's one of those things that I knew it would draw people in. So I was like, I really think we need like a smoked short rib pastrami style, and you know, we t I I talked about the whole dish, and and then another uh, sous chef, um, Matt Hawkins, um, very, he was amazing with the smoker. And, you know, we were all sitting at a table and we were talking about this idea. And he was like, I would like to I would like to take this thing home. And I was like, all right, cool. You know, we all worked on a Caesar dressing together and um, we worked on a plate up together. And, you know, but he banged out the short rib. And that was a large uh, I think a large portion of that dish's success is because of Matt. Yeah. Um, and a large portion of the the success of the grilled oyster was that moment with Tony. And I think, you know, looking back on it, like that was a really strong show of like what that restaurant stands for, which is creation through collaboration, you know. Mm -hmm. And I think if you want to talk about like freedom and creativity, I think when you sit in a room with a lot of people that push you in different directions and I guess can challenge your skill or challenge your knowledge because you all challenge each other, that freedom to be able to be in a safe space and talk about those things. And I think everyone worked together on something is pretty special. And looking back, those are great examples of why I should have stuck with that strategy. Right. You know? So I think a funny side story, uh, if I don't want to mess up your structure too oh, bad, no, no, but no, the no, other side story was like, you know, we didn't, we didn't quite know how much the short rib would sell. So like, the short rib is a nine-day process. It still is. So the first day, area was open. We sold out of short ribs, and we had no more. So and, we and had, at that point had you anticipated selling out to the point that you like had you already had enough for the next day? Oh no, of that nine day. No. Oh no, no. Okay, okay. No, we like sold out, sold out. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Big learning experience for me. Right. So like, I was like, "Fuck!" So we don't have short ribs for seven days. Yeah. That's why you know, like, the process is great and it's delicious, but fuck. Now we don't have seven days. So um, we had venison tartare on the menu, and Tony was like, well, why don't we just do a venison dish? I was like, fuck it. Let's just try a venison dish. And we put together a dish, and, like, I mean, the dish had morphed, like, a million times. I don't even remember what the dish day one was. I think we came up with, like, you know, uh, wood-grilled calabasa with uh, – we used to do this really interesting um, – uh, like, it was, um, like, a beef jus that was finished with calabasa puree – and sherry and like an aged sherry and you know we just put venison on the menu and then because we put venison on the menu we figured out that people would actually buy buy a venison entree um and then from day two like i would say the venison has been on the menu since day one it actually hasn't it's been on the menu since day two okay because it was yeah. forced to be on the menu because we ran out of short rib so you know that was another interesting side story of those two things yeah so that's, you know, the conversation of what it was like over the course of having just the one place. Right. Talk about, and we don't have to get into like, oh, what about the second one? Throw just sure. in, in general, talk about what that expansion does. Again, for your creativity and the sense of freedom that you have. Yeah. Because I, I, and, and I, this is a good question. And I say that because I don't think everybody 
would feel the way that you do. But again, like from conversations that we've had before, you don't quite get off on the operator side the way that you do being in the kitchen. Right. So uh, cause I, I think that maybe there are people in the world, and I'm sure you know some of them, that like, yeah, as it expands, they also love all this other shit just as much. And they're like, you know, what, what's the the Schwarzenegger quote from Pumping Iron? They're coming all the time. You okay. never, you've seen that? No. Oh, man. Yeah, it's him talking about lifting weights. It's like, in the morning when I wake up, I lift. I feel like I'm coming. I'm like uh, getting the feeling of coming in the gym. I'm getting the feeling of coming at home. I'm getting the feeling of coming backstage when I pump up. When I bowls out in front of 5,000 people, I get the same feeling. So I'm coming day and night. I'm coming day and night, coming all the time, coming, coming. Wow. Yeah, it's great. So wow. there are people who are Schwarzenegger pumping iron style coming all the time. Man, this is really took a turn. Uh, it's just what came to mind. It's what was in my heart. We know this isn't a kid-friendly show now. Well, I mean, uh, you know, Banco Podcast isn't either. So. <laughs> no, no. no. <laughs> um, um, but, but you know, the expansion necessarily means that you're pulled more and more away mm-hmm. from that. And also that you have more and more people that you have to put those constraints on. Sure. And also, not just constraints, right? That you also have to define the boundaries because it also, you know, means let them loose in different places. Yeah. So just talk in general about what expansion does to that sense of freedom for yourself and that you have to manage for other people. Well, this is a good question. Because... the kind I like to ask. Yeah, I mean, areas that... Uh, I'll go through... And I'll try to make it pretty brief because there's a good amount of them. But, like, Ariat's in a very interesting position now that, like, that team is so incredibly tight and they've all worked with me for so long. They kind of understand the mission, yep. you know? So I think right now, actually, interestingly, the last, like, six weeks has been the first time, actually, like, just maybe one dish in particular, two maybe? That I didn't have an idea that they presented to me one of their ideas and that it landed on the menu. Usually how that place works is like we'll sit all together. We'll sit for a couple hours. We'll come up with a bunch of ideas. We'll wrap on a bunch of things. We'll, and then we put a lot of things on paper. I you know, give them some reference recipes and stuff like that. They start to put things together. We set up a day that we all try at least components. And then we set up another day. We start to like test complete dishes together. And then that's when they kind of like end up on a menu. This has like been the first time that someone is just like they're really taken they've they understand the restaurant enough that they can start to create on their own. Yeah. Um well and that was an interesting experience for me because uh like I know like every dish on that menu's got a story and a reason and something that happened to me in my past and something that like I remember from when I was a child or You know, like whatever. So that one was like a very interesting time. But, you know, when you have talent, you have to let them grow to be creative so then they can also grow within themselves. Right. Right. Which is also the opportunity that I didn't have coming up under people because they didn't really afford me that opportunity. And I think it stunted my growth to an extent and also made me cagey and want to leave places. Thanks to our sponsor, Aganorsa Leaf Cigars. Aganorsa Leaf is renowned throughout the world for its signature flavor that possesses all the great attributes of Nicaraguan terroir, along with classic Cuban aroma and flavor. Aganorsa Leaf is pleased to announce a brand new edition of Guardian of the Farm, Cerberus named after the mythical three-headed hound that stood watch at the gates of Hades. This exciting new Nicaraguan puro uses 100% Aganorsa leaf tobacco and is wrapped in Aganorsa's new Corojo 2012 cover leaf, which adds a level of complexity to the blend, adding light spice and a rich, smooth body to the blend. When you smoke one of our world-class blends, you will experience the difference between ordinary tobacco and Aganorsa leaf. That's why we say... Our leaf is our strength. Learn more about Aganorsa Leaf and use their store locator and find a cigar shop near you that carries their products at www.aganorsaleaf.com. The two of us smoke Aganorsa Leaf cigars often. We also offer them to a lot of our guests, like, for example, Dave Arvello, who every time I post a picture of a, a Cerberus mentions to me in my DMs or in a text how cool the band is, which it actually is a pretty slick-looking band. Um, but also... 
I just want to note, little personal anecdote here, so it's not all totally straight up red. I can say that uh, Michael Beltran will absolutely not only vouch for the quality of Aganorsa cigars, yeah. but you met a uh, Miami legend and handed him an Aganorsa cigar. I did meet uh, uh, a Miami legend. I was smoking nearby Alonzo Morning, and we had a conversation about cigars, and he handed me one of his, and I went inside. I bought this exact same cigar, and I handed Alonzo Morning this Aganorsa cigar, and I said, try this. Thank me later. I mean, if that's not an endorsement, I don't know what is. Aganorsaleaf.com. Was was there somebody who... Would you say that you are giving your people more freedom than you were ever given? Um, I think the only chef that really gave me tons and tons of freedom was Norman. Uh, Norman, and, and listen, they didn't always land on menus. But, you know, like when yeah. I le- when I left um, Tuyo, like half that menu were my dishes. Yeah. And so you were being encouraged. Yeah, very much so. Yeah. And um, I learned a lot in that process, too, because then the next restaurant I went to, I had no freedom at all whatsoever. And that's okay. I learned a lot a lot in that place. I think that uh, is incredibly valuable now. So, you know, with, with, um, with the bad, there is a lot of good. But sure. So then branching out. And, uh, and sorry, but the the next place that you were at where you weren't given as much freedom, do you think that there was a good, for what the restaurant was, mm-hmm. do you think there was a good reason for that, in that model, in that space, to not give people as much freedom? No. Okay. All right. No, I just think my boss was a putz. I mean, if we want to just be very blatant. Not my boss okay. boss, but just my direct boss was a Got it. Putz. Okay. okay. So anyways, you know, expansion. I think that the the creativity portion of this is like, it's twofold. Right, like when you build a concept, you're not totally free, and this is why Ariad is such an interesting concept because there is no like boundary there necessarily. Like you can really fuck with a bunch of different stuff and be pretty outlandish and not feel like you're constrained to like a certain type of cuisine. Like there are certain things that we don't mess with, but we don't really mess with them because they're just not our bag. Yeah, you know, like there's a lot of French influence, there's Cuban influence, there's a lot of like Latin American influence, there's you know. European, Italian, there's a lot a lot of influence from all over the place there. Because the way I like to put it is that that, that is a chef-driven concept. You know, so menu structure, there's a good amount of like structure there, but like boundaries are kind of li- limitless. But when you start to build concepts, and I think this is where uh, it gets difficult, but also um, can be very easy. There's two different types. Like Nave was a little bit of a struggle for me. Um, not totally like something that I'm super uh, like I understand it but it wasn't like second nature like a lot of Ariad's food to me but then when you look at a concept like Chugs Chugs was a lot of fun for me and still is a lot of fun for me because it's a diner right like yeah. you go to a diner you can eat a Greek salad you know so my thought process was why can't you go to a diner and eat you know Cuban food and still do like diner classics you know egg salad chicken salad, pancakes, meatloaf, stuff like that. I mean, there's pierogies on that menu. Yeah. You know, so it really, um, it just, it, it, and it was all a bunch of food that I really enjoyed to eat too. So I had a lot of fun creating that menu and still do have a lot of fun messing with that menu because one, it's a lot of food I like to eat. Two, it's a lot of food I'm super familiar with and comfortable with. And three, it was a style of food that I wanted to get my hands on because I really wanted to, again, change what people's perception of the food was. So, like, we've talked about this a ton of times, too. Like, Cuban food just doesn't have to be, like, what people think it should be. Hmm. It could definitely be looked at through a different lens, and that's okay. Um, people get very offended by that statement, but um, it's totally fine with me. You know, like, I'm okay with doing croquetas at a short rib and croquetas at a black beans and... You know, what Gio does with the pastelitos, which is like all these weird, you know, outlandish things, which are all delicious. Yeah. You know, I'm okay with not pressing uh, certain Cuban sandwiches because I don't think they're better that way. And that's okay. You know, right. like, yeah. why not give it a shot? Well, that's not the way it's supposed to be done. Well, I don't know. I mean, are you the keeper of the sandwich? You know, like, I, I just don't, I don't know what to tell them. It's a good shirt. Yeah. I, you know, yes. But, and then I would go to like our most current, uh, concept, which is, you know, we took over uh, an existing bar restaurant that was in Shenandoah, which is like a 
Little Havana adjacent and Coral Gables adjacent and uh, actually Coconut Grove adjacent. And that one specifically I've had a lot of fun with because at a bar, um, you know, I opened up a, a restaurant as the sous chef called uh, the Local Craft Food and Drink. This is a long time ago. And that was a really cool experience because cool craft beers, cool craft cocktails, and really interesting food. You know, like obviously there's a burger, there's wings, but it's not like a traditional burger, not a traditional wing. And then a bunch of like cool stuff um, on the menu that was kind of like curveballs, which was great. Uh, you know, we did porchetta. We did a lot of in-house charcuterie. And the thing about that concept and the reason why I, I've had such a like enjoyable time creating that menu one is because the person that leads that kitchen is a very good friend and super talented which has a lot to do with how creative you as a chef owner can be because if they can't execute your ideas then it really doesn't matter right right um but him being as talented as he is and um you know hard working as he is and also being like very creative like i am it's very easy to sit down and just like want to change a whole menu because we have all these great ideas. Obviously, we can't do that. But uh, we have all these great ideas and all this cool shit. And it's like people just want to go in there. And they usually just want to have like a burger and a beer or a burger and a cocktail or whatever. But if you give them other options, yeah, it's cool. So like that one has, I would say like food-wise has zero structure. Like none. And that recklessness to me is exciting. Yeah. You know, like I don't have to be like, well, we're a Cuban restaurant. Right. Yeah. We are uh, an Italian restaurant. Uh, we are super fine dining restaurant too. Like that, there's a lot of uh, there's a lot of stress in creativity there because I would say from the fine dining side, the hardest point is like you can be creative and it could be beautiful, but is it delicious? Right. Which is uh, with fine dining food the most difficult thing. So like w- when we do food at Ariette and we do all this stuff and all this menu development, and all this uh, creativity, we sit there, we have a dish. And the first thing I always ask everyone at the table is like, do you find this delicious? And it's such a simple, stupid question, but that is the most important thing. Like you could be as creative as you fucking want. I've eaten at Alinea. I've eaten at places in Spain that shit is like, you know, you eat balloons at Alinea, right? Yeah. Yeah. But the balloon at Alinea is delicious. Also very creative. Also super weird. Right. Yeah. But there's, that's cool, you know? And I think when people go super creative, sometimes it becomes like sterile and um, not delicious. It's a little bit like, um, I don't know why this is the analogy that's coming to mind, but I'm sure it's one that will resonate with you. It's a little bit like like concept cars, where you're looking at a concept car sometimes, whatever year it might have been from, uh, and there's things about it that are impressive, Mm -hmm. right? That are interesting, that are weird. And then when it comes down to, would you enjoy this? as like your car right it's a different question well i think you know i have a a weird relationship with food and what i mean by that is like i think everyone's always looking in this weird search for perfection and um i don't know i find like the the best food the most delicious food is like perfectly imperfect there's imperfections because there's like a human element behind it. Like it's very hard to be perfect every single time. Yeah. You could strive for perfection, but achieving it is almost impossible. Yeah. And that imperfection, you know, shows the human element. And I, I think there's a lot of, there's a lot in that that makes food very special. Yeah. A lot of chefs would disagree. and That's totally fine. I don't, I'm not here to argue it. All I'm saying is that that's my feeling on it. Right. So like through the process of creativity, you come up with a lot of shit that's weird that other people could look at, look at as like imperfect, right? But in my mind, it could be the perfect pairing. And sometimes that shit works and sometimes it don't. Like it's totally okay. But right, like that, yeah. that again goes back to the fact of having creative freedom. So like the, um, so the Mighty, which will be the Gibson, right? Our new project that's in Shenandoah. Um, oh, the name changed. Yes, to the Gibson. Yeah. No, I, I was thinking of the Garrison. Right. That was the original working name. Got it. Um, he, uh, Chris and I were just sitting around just talking and, and he was like, you know, in New Orleans, they do this thing called Yaki Men. I'm like, explain it to me. He's like, it's like a, it's got kind of like gumbo flavors, but it's a ramen. I'm like, that's cool. So I started doing some research on it. I was like, man, it sounds super interesting, whatever. So I told him, I was like, let's put one together. We got all the ingredients or whatever. He started working on a dashi and 
you know, in a bar, like you don't totally think that there's going to be a ramen with like oxtail and, and shrimp, right? Yeah. But it's fucking delicious and it sells, you yeah. know, and which was like, I was like, we're going to put this on the menu. No one's going to buy it. It sells. And stuff like that is, is great, right? You show that it shows that people are willing to try some different stuff. It just doesn't need to be burgers and French fries, right. you know? And I think that people do pine for some some shit that's different. Of course, if you're going to have a burger, make it great. But if you only have one burger and you make that one burger great, then that's cool. You don't need five or right. seven yeah. or ten. You don't need that, you know? And that's, again, people will disagree, but um, that's totally fine. And, and I think that, like, the fact that, like, we did a, a chicken bacon ranch, but we did it, like, uh, Mexican inspired. So it's on, like, torta bread. Okay. And it's got, like... Um, chicken dinga on the inside and then it's got bacon and ranch and avocados and it's like delicious yeah. you know again all not stuff that you would totally see at a bar but that's okay we introduce like classic charcuterie you know just a nice charcuterie board whatever we sell them so that concept being so like open and free is a ton of fun yeah i mean it's just like it's from a creative aspect like you're you, and on, like you know shit could not work but it's okay put a po boy on the menu we got rid of some old shit that i fucking couldn't stand and people liked it but i was like you know i can't live with myself like selling stuff like this so we just had to rip the band-aid off and it's okay we always get like what happened to the old stuff i'm like we'll try the new stuff how about that how about that how about that Catch stuff? Me outside yeah <laughs> yeah so you know as as we grow like a lot of the other ones are concept based like laurel is like french mm-hmm. With a Cuban touch of, uh, with a Cuban touch on the food, and it's going to be a brasserie. So you're looking at like high brow but comforting food. Um, so you know you have limitations within that. You can't do a lot of things, uh, right. and that's cool. Uh, but it's still at the same time, you know, again, like putting the proper people in place and knowing their talent level. Um, when there's concepts like that, those people will get frustrated. You know, and it's still giving them avenues to be creative in the process, which I think is very important. Yeah. Which is cool. Yeah. You know? So let's uh, shift gears a little bit. Still in your restaurant life, but with a little bit of overlap with the Bangkok podcast Oof. stuff. I've heard of that show. Yeah. I hear it's a, I hear it's a chit show. Yeah. So. Yeah. They don't have, they don't have, pretz- they don't have snacks. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, nah, no. Nah. Uh, let's talk a little bit about the, the, your freedom in the sense of saying shit. Yeah. Well, I think, um, why did we start Punk Podcast, right? I think that we started, like, obviously I talk a lot, right? That's for sure. That's a given. Um, <laughs> but well, the, the real purpose was to, to, to provide a mouthpiece for people that didn't necessarily feel like they had one, right? That was maybe your motivation. Sure. I mean, it was mine for sure. I wanted to be able to give like, you know, people a real opportunity to talk about their story and like how, you know, the industry has a lot in common and how the industry has changed. And um, because like maybe media wasn't giving people the proper due, like, you know, like if we saw another top 10 list of like, the best fucking, I don't know, French fries in the city yeah. of like a person that's maybe like has their own vinegar program or their own like charcuterie program or they make all their own bread or, you know, and who knows, maybe they fucking buy their French fries. Probably. I mean, that shit, it's hard to make fucking fries. Yeah. You know, that was the, the real thing for me about starting Punko Podcast. And in that process, you know, it's given us a lot of opportunity to say a lot of stuff that's rubbed a lot of people the wrong way. Or it's gained us a lot of, um, I'm not going to say fans, but I don't know if we have fans. I, I think we have some. Right. So you were talking about giving people, uh, you know, giving voice to people who maybe didn't have one um, because of whatever gaps there were in, in food media. Sure. And yeah, that's, that's a... Uh, a true thing. I, I, when I say that it wasn't necessarily my motivation, I just frame it a little differently. I'm thinking more of the person who's listening to or watching the thing, right? I'm thinking more of them uh, in terms of you're not getting this, right? This interesting thing is there that other people aren't doing. I'm thinking more of the person who's consuming it than I am of like, oh, this person hasn't gotten to tell their story. Sure. But w- maybe it just takes one way, half dozen the other. Right. Um, but I'm thinking more of 
from the beginning when we started the podcast. Um, and it was one of the things that, you know, it wasn't necessarily what I was looking for, but when I started to hear these comments, like for whatever reason, the one that's most vivid in my mind is Pablo commenting the first time we had him on because he was like guest number two or something. Yeah. Uh, commenting that you had sort of a reputation for being more outspoken yeah. about than other people, not just about like, oh, here's this cool food thing I do, but things that might be more sensitive and rub, sure. you know, push some sensitive buttons. Yeah. So talk a little bit. There's a, there's a story that I, I won't repeat, but uh, just in case you want to tell it you know, your way about like uh, a Cuba related conversation like maybe it was like a twitter thing that you had with michael schwartz oh yeah right so like even before you had your own place oh, yeah, like yeah. It, it, it's just sort of been like a part of your dna to yeah. be very outspoken about this kind of thing well i think that um so there's a couple reasons why i can i'll say the, the before and after right sure, yeah. so like when i worked for michael um there was this uh cuba trip uh, that was being put on by uh, a Cuba chef was attached to it. And um, like it was promoting like fine dining in Cuba and six days on the island and Eto y Lodro and all this like really like outlandish shit. And the price tag was like 2500 bucks, right? Yeah. And I remember, I mean, this is a long time ago now. That's probably like 10 years ago. Yeah. I was like, pretty irate right and i'm like i mean these people have no fucking food like what kind of food are you going there to eat twenty five hundred dollars like how are you making money on these on this like starving country and they're going to show people like food in a country that doesn't have any fucking food and then like why are you showing off a country that's still openly communist and like really like doing what they do to our people and i said that to an extent obviously uh twitter had less characters before than it has now um, uh, yeah, I forget how many, but yeah. And, you know, I, and I had some tweets about it or whatever. I thought nothing of it, you know. I just, like, I said said what I said, and, I mean, I would say it again. Um, and then I don't remember which writer got their hands on my tweet, a couple other people's, like, Facebook comments, and some other stuff. And, like, you know, at that time I was just sous chef for Schwartz. And um, they printed the shit that I said. Uh, in the Herald, yeah, my and you know mine was like a small like line, and then those other guys that obviously had a, a bigger reputation, and you know there was more, and there was like actual like uh, interview stuff with them and comments from them or whatever. So then, uh, Schwartz got got like you know I got wind of it, so he asked me to meet me in his office, and like this was year one working for him, and we had like a, I mean Schwartz and I have had have had and still have a great relationship. I have an immense amount of respect for him and, you know, like we're still very tight. And um, he just told me, he was like, well, you know, like this is a little problematic, right? And I'm like, well, but why? And he was like, well, you know, just like <coughs> we had just opened up this restaurant. Maybe this brings like negative press or whatever. And I said, you know, listen, I, I get what you're saying, but I, I, I won't I won't not say shit. You know, it's just not part of like who I am. And I, as much as I respect you and I love my job and like I did love my job um, very much. And as much as I love my job and as much as I respect you, like this subject specifically and a lot of others when as time has passed. But this subject specifically, no one will ever like tell me not to say shit. You know, if there's anything that like this world has afforded us, it's an opportunity to say things. Right. Because that's what that's the whole reason why like our whole our whole like country came here, mm -hmm. right? Like why our families fled so they could say shit. You know? Sure, yeah. Uh, that's putting it in very like simple terms, but yeah, yeah. That's pretty much why, right? Um, and he was like, uh, you know, I guess, and I don't remember the conversation verbatim. And he was like, you know, like I respect that. You know, it's just like maybe. And he was like, I support you. Um, like just maybe when you do something like that, just like run it by me. I'm not telling you not to do it, but just so like I don't get like an email like your sous chef said X, Y, and Z, um, you know, and I was like, that's cool. And he was like, you know, if you want to say things, you say things, you know, like um, just, you know, like think about like if there if there could be repercussions and not for me, just like from the world. And I said, fuck it. I mean, that's that's the way shit works. You know? Right. Um, 
you know, I gained a lot of respect for him that day. I think for him even having that conversation with me, I learned a lot about like being a boss and like, I'm not going to say that that was like minutia, but I think compared to his, like his job and like the shit that he has like on his desk that he has to deal with every day, that's like really small minutia, you know? And, uh, I learned a lot in that process too. Like, you know, people aren't always listening, but they may. And if you have the opportunity to at least just get, get them to hear like one thing, and we've said this so many fucking times on our podcast, right? Like right, yeah. if we could touch one person and it makes a difference in one person and then they tell two more people and then those people tell four more people and those four people tell six people, like maybe we can actually make a difference in something that um, really, and what we talked about, like this issue that we're not going to talk about at length here, which is Cuba. Like, but, but it applies to other things. Sure. Yeah. Um, maybe we can make a difference, you know? And I do think the the work that we've done on Pancom podcast and albeit like um we're not quite rogan but um no, not since he took all our spotify he money. took all of our spotify money um you know i think it has made a difference and I, I think it has held a lot of people accountable um within the industry outside the industry at least like for me um people don't ever come to me with bullshit ever like they're never gonna bring bad deals to me they're never gonna like they know if people are um like close to the family or whatever, they know that we're going to do our best to like support our people and uh, make sure we keep them away from bad deals and help them work through their deals and be like a real support system for them. And that's all because we've said, and we will say the shit that we always say, right. You know, and that's cool. You know? So that's, that's an interesting uh, angle. I, I hadn't like imagined that I would ask the question, but talk about, I think when people think of, being very outspoken and you know uh at at its like least charitable it's like you know having no filter and sure. being or or even just like you know i don't know some sense of like yeah sorry just it's something else i was thinking about so yeah. like that instance with michael and then comparison to now like i was an employee right yeah now i am the employer sure right and also with being the employer i don't have a boss but technically, my employees are my boss, right? Like, there's a lot of ways there that I work for them. And, and you have investors and partners. And right. But my investors, bosses, but... My, my, my investors uh, I think they look at, like, my outspokenness as a bonus for them. That's what I, they've bought into already. Yeah. I don't know if they've totally seen it as a negative yet. Maybe one day they will. But this right. at this point, they're already f- f- too far deep. Yeah, so, yeah. Um, <laughs> you know, like, uh, back then, I think the repercussions were, like, getting fired you know, now the repercussions are different, uh, but there still are some, um, there definitely are some, but I don't have to answer to anybody. Right. Which is big freedom. Have, Have you been, have you found yourself in the position that Michael was in on whether it was an industry type of topic, but like somebody said a thing or did a thing publicly or whatever, uh, may like you know and it's like the publicly thing is it's really never about like them having like free speech or being able to be free yeah yeah it's more like listen you got two banged up at this place and they told me that you did x y and z maybe oh no yeah it, I, I i mean more more, more like, that yeah but not okay. like uh i've never i haven't really been put in the situation that someone says something yeah yeah um i don't think that's ever happened though got it okay So uh, where I was going with that, you know, um, was, you know, I think people, when they talk about the consequences Mm -hmm. of being as open as you've been with the podcast, but well before that and in other avenues, uh, like, for instance, we're recording this on, what, Wednesday the 27th? Yeah. Tomorrow, Thursday the 28th, you'll be on La Ventanita. Right. Uh, So, you know, you do other shit. Mm-hmm. Um, talk about what good has come of it. And you touched on a little bit of that, but I guess I'm just asking you to expand on that. Like, what has, what good has come of exercising, yeah. you know, that that right and 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 acting on that impulse more than I think it's fair to say more than a lot of other people would. Because I, I hear the comment very often. Of you what? know, what's the comment? No, like what Pablo was saying, like people oh. people will tell you or me or whatever, like that's a thing that you're known for is that you know you 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 don't hesitate the way some other people would to express yourself, whether it's controversies like the Cuba related ones sure. or the restaurant industry related ones, you know, mm-hmm. where 
it's not any kind of a secret. Like we just scheduled to talk with uh, um, Lee Schrager with Lee Schrager right. uh, of the uh, South Beach Wine and Food Festival. Super excited for that. So I mean, and, and that's one you know that I think has been uh, the one that people refer to the most, right? You know, when they talk about what you're outspoken about. So not necessarily to get into that topic, but just like oh, what man. good has come of you being this outspoken. I want to talk about that. You, um, you said you do or you don't. I do. I do. Okay, we can. We can just real quick before we get into that. I think that that one's going to be very interesting for a couple reasons. Like fundamentally, I think that the ideology behind what they do is is a little fucked, right? I don't have a problem with that human being personally. Yeah. Like, uh, explain what you mean for the benefit of the. Well, yeah. So, like, um, you know, the South Beach Food and Wine Festival. I think that they have kind of made their bones on the South Florida market, and they've used a lot of the South Florida restaurants to. Um, kind of like give give Sobe like uh, like Sobe but like the South Florida market puts meat on the bone but then they give all the dollars from the meat on that bone to like other people you know what I'm saying like I don't really think like it, it, essentially the money that they're making from there I don't think it's benefiting the restaurants at all right okay. It's not like, you know, when you ask me to do an event, you're going to pay me to do said event, right? You're not going to like just say, okay, I'm just going to pay for like your materials. Um, and I'm, I'm not going to pay you enough to cover your materials, but we still expect you to do pretty much like 72 hours of work, essentially. And then we're going to ask you to put your employees in that position that they also have to do 72 hours of work. So the stress on the restaurant is massive, like fucking astronomically massive, especially when you're in the small market like we are now. There's a lot of restaurant people that don't feel the same way that as I do. And that's cool. And that's totally okay. You're all entitled to your own opinion. But all I'm trying to say is that this conversation needs to be had. Right? Sure. And there's been articles written about like the amount of money that Sobe's made and all that. And all that shit I don't give a fuck about. What really matters to me is like how do you highlight us? Right? How do you, how do you highlight the market that is essentially giving you the platform to do what you do? Because hmm. you don't. Because every time you drive down the street and it says Sobe, there's a picture of Guy Fieri, which, listen, I have no problem with him. I actually think the guy's great, right? Or Giada De Laurentiis or Robert Irvine, which is a fucking schmuck or like a bunch of people like that, which is cool. But why not do the same thing for other people? These people draw to your city and this city right now is the number one draw in the country. So why not help them the fuck out? Right. So I get I always get the stance of like being the bad guy because I say shit like this but at the same time like I, I gave that festival 10 years of my life I did it every year for 10 years right mm -hmm. and like what have I ever gotten from it now, I can guarantee I can almost boldface guarantee you not one person that went to a Sobe kiosk to eat an area a semblance of an area dish because it's not even going to be like even close right. to what it should be has visited my restaurant ever. Like not once, maybe once. I don't know. I'm being a little uh, dramatic, but I think at the end of the day, like the, the juice there is not worth the squeeze. Right. You know? And again, maybe like the fact that there's a bunch of yes men around them. Right. And nobody's saying like, Hey, you should do maybe, maybe we should try a little more. And like their, their softball of a try with me obviously did not get, um, like it was not a, uh, I, it, it didn't go well. I ended up not doing the dinner because we had creative differences. And, you know, when you tell me I'm going to have creative freedom, I'm going to have creative freedom and I'm going to do whatever I want. Right. So if I can't pair a wine because you don't carry that wine, you are the, like the wine pairs with my dish. This to me is freedom because this is exactly what I want to use. And in this instance, it was a wine that you would have been willing to bring in yourself. For yes. Purposes of the pairing. Absolutely. Just to give again, just to give the we, we said we would either go, we would buy. Or uh, we would ask this certain winery to assist us because it was right. a small boutique winery and we wanted to highlight. Yeah. So I, I don't want to get bogged down in it, but just to clarify that right. point, again, for the person watching, you had agreed to do uh, dinner with a number of other chefs from other restaurants. When you all came to terms with the festival about what the thing would be, they said that you had total creative freedom. Sure. And then down the road, when you're actually trying to execute, you say you're going to pair X and Y wine. 
and the festival says, well, no, actually, they've all got to be from such and such a distributor. Well, because they're they're supported by Southern Wine and Spirits. Right. right. And, and at that point, you say, well, that's not what I was told from the beginning. You didn't put those barriers there, and now I'm, and, I'm and, out. And this is the hard part, right, of being like the guy that always has like a stance, right? Because now, right. now I'm just being like a stubborn dick. That's essentially what, what in their mind, yeah. I'm being stubborn. And yeah, I, I'm being stubborn. I am. Because yeah. if we're never stubborn, change will not happen. Right. It will just continue to happen the same fucking way. So anyways. So I, I bring that up uh, not to get too bogged down in those details, but it's a good example of the kind of thing that you've been very public about that I think a lot of other people wouldn't be public about. Sure. Um, and I'm sure you're not the first or the last person who's had some kind of frustration with that festival, but there are a lot of people who wouldn't dare say that kind of shit publicly well which is uh, go exactly to your point is like there's a lot of backroom conversations there's a lot of bar and, and, I, and i'm sorry just to, not to but i, I want to make sure that i'm clear i'm not saying that they wouldn't dare because if they did i don't know the fury of lee schrager would come down on them right I mean, no 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 for whatever it no, is no, no. For, for all i know i've well, never met lee i've never spoken to lee Maybe he Lee is a super nice guy to talk to him. He's not like a bad to me. He doesn't strike me as like a bad guy. But at the same time, there hasn't been someone else saying, like, look, this is not working. Okay, it's just not working for us. And I hate to say us is like I represent the whole community because I don't. There's other people that love it. Us as an area. Area and whoever it might be. Sure. Operates and feels like area. And I I think it's also because, like, the idea of that whole thing and being a part of it is just this, like, oh, what I was invited. And it's like, oh, my God. It's prestige. And I'm like, fuck that, man. It's also, the I I think, and and now we're kind of, I think part of it is also that it's Miami. And it's such an emerging food market. And they're, for the person who wants the prestige, I think it's, it's a market that's still coming into its own. And so there aren't all of these other sources of prestige. Sure. So like if you miss the Sobe boat, you basically are like waiting another year before a big organization in Miami can recognize you and give you some kind of a prize, which, you know, shouldn't be the be all and all, but it's nice to, to do and participate in or whatever. Yeah. It's not, it's, but it's not like we're one of these cities that has like a bunch of major sure. food things happening. Yeah. I mean, I think like, um, I personally was like just so worn down by the conversation. Then also, I think the years of like just running my own ship was like worn down. Like, I think there was a day that I was like, why the fuck do we do this for nothing? You know, like, I don't like I don't want to do this for nothing. I I, we can't do it for nothing. Well, but let's let's not keep because we're going to have the conversation with Lee. Yeah. And and if you're watching this or listening to this, look at me looking into the camera like this is a real show. Right. Uh, you should subscribe to Bunkum Podcast. We'll be recording with Lee Schrager of the South Beach Wine. And we Food should do it live. Soon. By the way, I have not read to you uh, the email he sent me. Oh, I, I I sent you one of them. Right. And then I didn't send you the follow up because I was like, let's just make sure we schedule this before I show this to Mike. Oh, is it bad? Uh, it's not, it's it's not bad. It, I think it, none of it will be surprising. I was I was more surprised that he said the the things to me. Oh, yeah, and didn't put me in the email. But you were never in it to begin with. So. Oh, I thought you sent it to me, too. No, no, I just forwarded it. Oh, yeah? I, I blind copied you. Oh, uh, man, I'm BCC. super intrigued. So, I'll, But I'll, we'll talk about it later. But Fuck, my, now I'm intrigued. Now I'll, you can't do that to me, right? No, no, like, right now, we'll talk about it as soon as we're done recording. We won't be doing this too much longer. <sighs> Fine, I'll, I'll, but yeah, we're going to cut this we'll out. We'll cut this part out. Pew, pew, pew. So, Welcome back to the Liberated Podcast with Nicholas Jimenez and uh, guest Michael Beltran yes, from Pancom Podcast. So the question... Take it away, Nick. The question was, when it comes to all of this outspokenness, uh-huh. talk about some of the good that's come out of it for you. Mm. I'll give you some examples if you want to start off. Sure. Not right. because I'm... But because you've told me in the past. Right. I think you've told me of at least one, if not two or more times, that some of that led to talent coming to you and oh, saying yeah. that they wanted to work for the company. Yeah. A couple of times that they haven't totally panned out, but that's happened. Yeah. You know, um, man, I don't know. Like it's really weird. Like the weird pockets of like how it's really been good, you know, cause I don't take compliments super well, but, but it doesn't have to be, com- I'm not, I'm not saying like, Oh, somebody patted more like, 
Maybe you created an opportunity. Maybe there's a relationship that only exists because you are. Well, I, th- you I think it it's way. like it's also interesting because people get to know us really well. Uh, and when I say us, like <coughs> area hospitality super well. Mm-hmm. And I think like we're a young company that has some pretty progressive ideas when it comes to like hospitality and stuff. And I think that gets people to know us pretty well. I think it, it does get people in the door. Some like just random people that will listen to a podcast and really like it and they'll come to eat. Um, you know, uh, I was on like two different shows this past year that people listen to the podcast first uh, or after my like weird Zoom audition, they would listen to the podcast and be like, I guess we like this like really aggressive talk. I don't know. Uh-huh. Um, I think more like some of the good I've seen out of it is like, yeah, my outspokenness has been a little rough, but there's also been people that have come to me with questions and stuff uh, about helping them through certain situations that maybe I can't help personally, but my business partner can. Right. And uh, by the way, I don't mean just the podcast, right? Just in general, you it, you know, maybe you found that you think somebody respects you a certain amount. Yeah. Like, I'm sure Michael, like, you know, in, in that context, you were talking about finding a, a respect for him. I'm sure that there were things about that interaction that he appreciated about you. Yeah. And that ends up, in, you know, affecting that relationship. I, I don't know. Like, it's just, it's, I'm trying to put context to the, yeah, the yeah. answer, you know, and it's like, you know, people come to me a lot because they know I don't give a fuck about, like, um, perception of, like, I guess, normally chefs want to be known as it's like a certain thing and i'm not I, I don't totally care to be that and i think people really appreciate that we get like weird uh um like comparisons to like some certain food legends that i don't totally agree with uh which i won't repeat um because i think like what they did like changed the world of hospitality as we know it right um and i think if i mean i guess if we're a sliver of that that's cool but I think people feel more empowered. I think there's a lot of that. And I think if there's anything that I can add is like, you know, Bourdain said it a lot. And, and it was like the kind of people that are in the back of the house or in front of the house or in restaurants in general, they come from all different walks of life. And like what they bring to the world is incredibly special. And, you know, we are no longer the help. And I think people need to hear that, right? Because our, you know, at the end of the day, like our, our goal is to have a guest, have a great experience, but like, I'm, I'm not your bitch. And I think like, that's something that people need to say and they need to like put that out there because it's incredibly important. You're not going to be able to talk to me however the fuck you want to. Right. And I've, I've obviously, I've said this several times, like I've kicked people out of Ariette because they were treating my staff poorly, you know, like some random fucking guy didn't like a salad and he's fucking berating a manager in the, in the middle of the restaurant. I'm like, look, you and all your people can get the fuck out. I don't need your money that bad. You know? So I, I guess like empowerment is something that I guess a nice side effect that I've seen out of people. Mm-hmm. Like I do see people giving less fucks and I don't know if that's because of us or not, or because of me or not, or, uh, but I think that's, um, uh, that's cool to see. I mean, I, I I keep referring to him maybe because I referred to him the first time. I keep thinking of other conversations, but I know Pablo himself yeah. has has said that right yeah. uh, that it's had that effect on him. And as a general rule, I think like it's very rare that you get that kind of a comment, that you get that kind of feedback, and that the person who said it out loud to you is the only person who feels that way. Yeah, I think where there's one person saying it, there's at least a few more that either the conversation just hasn't happened or they just are, you know, they don't know you personally. And so they're not going to come tell you or whatever. And I often feel like the people that have the, the opposite argument is like, why, why you got to be that way? You know, why you got to be that way? Um, (laughs) Are the people that maybe like internally, they may want to. Yeah. And they just don't. Sure. You know, because there's a lot of repercussions that come with it. You know, like just to be totally honest, like we don't, we get contacted by media because they're kind of forced to at this point, right? Because I think within the city, like we're big enough that yeah, you have to pay attention. It's an omission if they don't. Right. Um, but they're not like, they don't, uh, you're not like the sweetheart to them. You're not, you're not the one that makes it in all the articles. You know, the pictures aren't of you. They're of other people. And, and it's, that's okay. Like for me, that's fine. I don't really give a fuck. Like, and I've said this several times, like we have created our own source of media for ourselves, And obviously for like bigger goals and missions that we have, 
but you know like i think the stories that we have told and have been told on our podcast um give an in-depth look to a community that i think was pining to be noticed right and i don't know if that that's gotten them noticed like on the national scale or whatever uh i think locally it's worked a lot and i think that it's been great um so you know the zero fucks given kind of like tone i see a lot now i really love and i don't know if that's from us or not uh or if we have helped or been like a small little but i think we have and during covid man during i mean i almost got arrested a couple times during covid right um because of like outspokenness of like not wanting to be closed or it's like ridiculous for us to be closed at seven why the fuck are we going to open anyways and it's just like suffocating a thing and just getting phone calls like you're gonna get arrested if you're still open at this time i was like fuck it then we're gonna get arrested right um maybe some of that has given more of that um kind of like strengthen people because they see like they're not alone which Mm -hmm. i love because they're not alone right you know And, and i think again it's like that back room conversation of like i wish we could do this i wish i mean we can we can say whatever the fuck we want right 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 you know our job is still to execute like a great experience for the guest and our job is still to execute high quality food and our job is still to do x y and z that doesn't mean that we need to shut the fuck up in the process yeah you know and uh i feel super fortunate that we you know at least some people listen so i'm sure there's a lot more that we could say but that's it man I think that's probably a good place to cut it off because I'll probably wow. drag you back here to do this again. Oh, cool. For example, one thing that we didn't talk about at all, which I don't want to start now because well, I wonder. that can... Tell me, tell Well, me. no, but just the, the question of like as a business owner and political freedoms. Right. Whether it's, you know, freedom for in... Uh, uh, and not like in a necessarily in sort of a... But just, you know, uh, all of the regulatory stuff you deal with. That's a super... We could do a whole hour on... So many hours. Permitting and regulation and, and whatever. Uh, permitting is uh, interesting. And, and it doesn't even have to be in terms of whether it's just... I, I think it would be interesting for someone who's not in that world to get a sense of just what you have to navigate. Yeah, uh, I mean, I would say to be totally frank, like that conversation is... I'm aware of it and I deal with it a lot, but... Like, you know, uh, my two business partners want like, you know, one does finance and accounting. The other one does leases and permitting. So he would be a little better to talk about it because it is a lot of hurdles. But, yeah, we can uh, come back for round two with Mike Beltran on the Liberated Podcast. We can bring somebody else in. Yeah. We're talking about Andrew or we're talking about uh, Mike is that's that's like his uh, uh, Mike falsetto. That's like his thing. But, you know. The, the lease thing is incredibly important. Like, you know, he works hard for like a full year to get to really like grind down. People don't understand how fucking important that shit is to just grind down a lease to things that are like every side's got to win. But you got to get yours, yeah. too. And that's all. Yeah, that's a whole other thing that right. the, the negotiation of the lease. But I'm, I'm talking about more just like a permitting part. No, I get it. Yeah. The, yeah. Permits and uh, uh, all of the stuff that is just inescapable. That's Fuckery. not that's not a negotiation that you can find end runs. Right. Maybe. Yeah. But that that kind of thing is the stuff that I think a lot of people just don't have a view into. You have a vague set. But I mean, including me, like if you if I was going from beginning to end of the process of like from concept to first day open, of course I would run into a million and a half fucking things that mm. would be totally new to me as far as all of the barriers to entry and, and permit shit and all that stuff. And I just think it would be interesting for people to get a view into that aspect of, of uh, an industry they interact with every single day. And there's so much of it that's just like behind that curtain. Right. Um, yeah. Yeah. Fuckery. Yeah. I didn't call it that. You did. No, I mean, you know. But yeah. I mean, yeah. That's what it is. Yeah. It's interesting. Yeah. So with that, this has been the Liberated Podcast. Michael Beltran, do you want to offer any shameless plugs? These fucking, these pretzels are delicious. Nuts.com is where they came from. It's interesting because they're actually pretzels. Yeah. Um, I might have, I still haven't had one. I'll, I'll, I'll take a piece of those. Um, Just a fun fact so everyone knows. Yeah. Nicholas Jimenez does not like mustard at all and does not like honey mustard. I like honey mustard more than mustard. Well, yeah. But of I course. don't like but I don't like mustard, yeah. Yeah. So, I'll try so one of those. So, what do you put on your sandwich? sandwich? What kind of sandwich? Let's say a cold cut. Uh, mayo. Mayo. Yeah. Just mayo. Just mayo. 
Oh, yeah? You yeah. putting a pickle on a cold cut? No. No pickles. No, no, on anything. Oh, so those pickles in your fridge right here? No. Oh, no. No. Huh. No pickles on anything? No pickles on anything. You go turkey or ham? I prefer ham. Oh, yeah? But I'll eat turkey. I like turkey. Like a honey, like a honey ham? I can eat a honey ham, but that's not my go-to. But what's like your cold cut? So if you're not putting like pickles, yeah. What tell me? Like, like I'm I'm at the Publix Deli and I'm building a sandwich. Sure. What are you putting on there? Um, I am. If it's cold, because I was gonna say I, I would probably go chicken, but that's not quite a cold cut. No, no, you gotta go the cold cut, cold cut. Roast beef. Oh yeah. Yeah. I like roast beef and like a horseradish. I was gonna say horseradish thing. Uh, otherwise. Um, this isn't something you get at like a at a grocery store deli, but like a club, mm-hmm. you know. Yeah, ham, tomato, mayo. Yeah, uh, even just ham and mayonnaise, I'm happy with. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. White bread. Yep. Yeah. Huh. I yeah. don't have strong bread feelings. No. No. I mean, obviously, it depends on what's in there, but. Are you ever go to wrap? I'll do a wrap. Yeah. Oh, but more like if the format is convenient for the situation. Like if I know I'm going to eat it in my car. Yeah, yeah. I maybe, mean, that's why maybe I, I go that route. You know, the Crunch Trap Supreme is engineering genes. Can I tell you that uh, Has it, tur- it, it turned out to be a hoax? What? But I was seeing rumors being spread online that the Crunch Trap Supreme was what Amber Heard shat onto Johnny Depp's bed. Wow. Turns out that was not the case. Talk about like an incredible, <laughs> just like bombardment of memes oh man so by from that whole you know that whole thing you know what's most fascinating to me about the whole thing and i don't know if it's just that i am like ostrich style head in the ground but you can't not hear about the johnny depp amber heard thing and yet i still don't really know what's going on i have no idea what's i don't going know on. what I don't she know. said about him i don't know why they're why what they're the in the deal trial. i have no idea all huh? i know is she should she shot on his bed i mean yeah and there's a lot of other things like I watched a small video just kind of making fun of, like, her lawyer. Uh-huh. Because Johnny Depp, like, he's a smooth guy. He is. He's a very smooth guy. He's, like, I I enjoy, like, his interaction here. And he's just, like, he's just clowning this attorney. Yeah. It was a uh, fecal delivery. <laughs> right. And this guy, he's just, like, this guy read the text. Yeah. That about, sounds is that is that not hearsay? Yeah, <laughs> it's hearsay. <I laughs> and he's like, he's uh, the guy's reading this text about fuck, man. I don't remember, like maybe her shitting in his bed or something along those lines. <laughs> and he read it twice, and he's like, uh, I could not hear you. Can you repeat it one more time? And yeah, I was just yeah, like, yeah. what a gangster! I love that. He's just clowning <laughs> this guy, and um, he's uh, um, and he just like. Very smooth. Yeah, 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 for sure. I'll get. I'll give it to him. He's like very, and he's almost for like sure. he's almost like grinning. Yeah, and I'm like, man, what is even? I don't even. Again, I have do no you know, idea. You don't what, know why. I know. I know that this is a defamation suit. Okay. I. I if, well, she defamed his bed. She de- she defamed his bed. I right. think it's. I think it's something like she accused him of beating her or something. Okay. And it turned out to not, or it seems to have turned out not to be true. Right. And so now he's suing her because he supposedly lost uh, jobs or money or something. Well, I mean... Like I, he got dropped from Pirates, like Pirates 6 or something. Well, he actually... Um, Disney didn't support him, and then they dropped him, and then when they saw... This is just... I'm probably butchering this whole thing, but then when they saw that it was like false allegations or whatever, then they tried to get him back. And then he publicly said he would never work with Disney again. Oh, I didn't know that. Right. So that was like the thing. I don't know if there's any other jobs, but like, I mean, his legend is growing super deep now. Yeah. Like this chick shit in his bed. He's like totally clown. <laughs> He's totally clowning this lawyer. Yeah. And I'm like me. I don't even know what's going on, but I'm laughing my ass off of his interactions with this lawyer. And I'm just like, yeah. And then it's crazy. Um, one of my favorite parts was like, you know, before you take five minutes to uh, respond uh, to my mention, he's like, you mean like all the time it takes you to find your paperwork? And I'm like, wow, this is so good. Like, what the fuck? I don't even know. Again, I don't know what's happening. I'm like, I, have no I don't idea. know what's happening, but this is amazing. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So. Um, so. Yeah. DadeMag.com slash liberated. Don't shit in the bed. 
don't shit in the bed. And also, Michael Beltran, do you have any shameless plugs you want to offer people? Do I have, I have to do them here, right? Because this isn't ours. I'm yeah, we don't here. have a, we don't have a song here. Noah didn't give us the rights to use huh? it on this podcast. Um, Ariette Miami, mm-hmm. Chugs Diner Miami. Is it Chugs Diner? Chugs Diner Miami. I think it's just Chugs Diner. Chugs Diner. Um, Nave Miami. Uh, the Taurus scapegoat. Look up all those things mm-hmm. on the gram. Also, you can follow the journey of us reopening or um, the transformation of the mighty into the Gibson um, live on Instagram after we delete uh, all their fake followers and um, really terrible previous posts. Uh, so stay tuned. And, um, you know, my uh, personal shit is Pig Inc. Um, cool. That's I think that's all the... You could also follow uh, at Pancom Podcast. That's right. Thank um, you for plugging Pinecone Podcast. Yeah, it's a really long format, no structure podcast uh, that you can find on Dave Mag. And if you have money that you want to give to us, we're on uh, Patreon. Patreon, there you go. That's right. Patreon.com slash Dave Mag, D A D E M A G. Give us all of your Stay money. Stay tuned for our OnlyFans. They're coming up soon. That's right. And now I'm going to stop this recording and restart. All the cameras because we're going to read some ads. Oh, cool.